Hi, Dr. Danny Klitich here. Thanks for tuning in to the second part of the uh, Citrus webinar series we have. This is the second of three of three, uh, we'll call them episodes for this. Uh, we're talking about size, bricks, and pound solid in this one. Uh, the first one we did was about abiotic stress and stress and how to help build a root, healthy root system and things like that. So if you missed that, make sure to get back, go back there and catch it. And then the third one that we'll be doing after this, we'll be talking about how to support bloom, how to reduce drop, and how to make sure that we have the most efficient use of time and set and bloom that we can in that third in that third video. So make sure you catch all three in the series. Thanks for tuning in to number two, and I hope you enjoy it. The Citrus Solutions uh, webinar powered by Redox. We were talking today about size bricks and solids. Um, I'm Dr. Danny Klitich. I am the coastal agronomist for Redox. I cover the California coast, a little north of LA, up to um, a little south of San Francisco. Uh, we do grow a lot of citrus on the southern southern half of that um, southern half of that, and I guess all the way up the coast because there is some citrus in, even up in Monterey County. So um, do a lot of consulting in citrus, and excited to bring some of that to you guys today. I'll be John. I'll be joined by John Kelly. I'll introduce him in a little bit when it gets to his section. So uh, wanted to start here um, with this with this picture of a beautiful lemon set just about ready to get harvested. I think this this uh, I just love this picture because it's, it's, um, you know, it's what, it's what we're doing, right? It's why we're here. Um, it is, sorry, I had something pop up on my screen. It, we're here, we're here to grow lemons now, unfortunately, or we're here to grow citrus. Now, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of challenges that we come up with over the season, um, that can be very stressful on our, on our lemons. And we have lots of yield goals that we're trying to hit. And a lot of the times we can end up with, um, with, issues in the field that we need to address. So you can see here that we have um, some obvious micronutrient deficiencies here on these trees. And this can really impact our yield, especially our quality goals and things like that. So I wanted to bring that up and come on, and say, you know, it, as, as the tree declines, we're gonna have challenges hitting our size goals. We're gonna have challenges maintaining canopy vigor and this can be, um, all these things can lead into issues. So today we're gonna really focus on how do we fill bins with quality fruit and and hit and hit our yield goals and our quality goals. So that's what we're going to hop into. So uh, we're going to start with an introduction to Redox for those of you that aren't familiar with our company. And then we're going to talk, John is going to talk about nitrogen metabolism and how that builds into size solids and bricks. Then I'll, I'll review some micronutrient basics um, and their importance in, in hitting yield. And then we'll review a couple uh, field experience rates and timing, some, some uh, fertility programs. And I emailed those out to you um, to you right about an hour ago, if you RRCP'd before that. So you should have gotten those. If you didn't, we'll, we'll send them out in a follow-up email um, so that you have those programs to look at. And we'll just kind of talk about some of the strategies when we're looking at how to hit these size solids and bricks and what our key timings are. So um, housekeeping, like I said, ask your questions, use the chat or the questions function. We'll be monitoring those. And um, if you have any other, if you have any other questions about uh, uh, functional use of the platform, feel free to ask those as well. And we have uh, Sam's on standby here to help you out if you need a, if you've got a question on that. So um, with that, who is, what's our purpose at Redox? Redox exists to create passion and excitement about growing plants. I think that's why a lot of us got into agriculture is we, uh, maybe we enjoy eating, but we also enjoy growing plants. And, uh, and that's really the basics of a lot of the agriculture that we do is, is, is really pushing growth and getting better at growing plants um, with, an economic, with an economic focus in mind. So um, we have three core values at Redox, passionately authentic, creatively driven, and scientifically knowledgeable. And we hope to bring all three of those to you today through this webinar. Be uh, simply, Redox is a bionutrient company that focuses on sustainable plant nutrition. And with that, I'd like to kick it off here with a little video introducing the topic today. Hi, welcome to the Lemon Orchard. I wanted to kick off the discussion today about bricks, pound solids, and size with some of, some of the symptoms we see in the Lemon Orchard that might precede our issue with, with hitting our targets on those three key attributes of many of our citrus crops. So you can see here, I'm in a Lemon Orchard. This is in Santa Paula. You can see we have some micronutrient deficiencies showing up. Um, micronutrients are really important for all the different fa facets of uh, metabolism within the plant. When we start seeing deficiencies, that means we're short on something, and that means we have a limiting factor that's reducing our potential yield. So we want to address that. 
So lemons here on the coast, we almost always have micronutrient problems because we always have uh, small fruit on the tree. I don't know if you can see that in here. There's a lot of them. We also have bloom. I don't have any good bloom here in this frame. But and we also have this orchard actually just got picked a couple weeks ago. So we have pickable fruit, new bloom, sizing fruit. And in fact, we also have new flush coming in. I don't know if you can see that, but there's new flush as well. So these trees are workhorses. They're always doing everything, it seems like. And we uh, really utilize micronutrients to help push them along and attain our yield goals. In many cases, we'd like to get four or five picks off these trees a year. So they really do work hard for us. Um, so I'm really looking forward to having a discussion here about how to push up our size, our bricks, and our pound solids. We're going to kick off the discussion with John Kelly here, and he's going to and he's going to present on nitrogen metabolism and some of the key products as well as the agronomy of how to hit your hit your yield goals and hit your goals on size, bricks, and pound salt. So thanks for watching. Looking forward to, to the discussion. Thanks. All right, so John's going to kick it off here. Um, John is a, is a Redux agronomist. He's our corporate agronomist. John's a certified as both an advisor and sustainability specialist with the American Society of Agronomy. He has worked for Redox Bionutrients for 26 years and is one of the founding partners with Redox and providing experience solutions uh, for a variety of crops across the world, including a lot of time spent in citrus. So um, with that, John, I will stop sharing here and let you take it away. Okay. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, we're good. All right, perfect. Well, I'm glad to be able to share a few minutes with you and, and uh, hope that my comments will be beneficial. When, uh, when we discuss quality, um, you know, at Redox, we tend to focus on, on four key areas nitrogen metabolism, nitrate conversion, which is, which is very important, uh, the whole nitrogen metabolism discussion. I'm gonna actually focus on a specific area of nitrogen metabolism um, that I'll get into in just a few minutes. Uh, fruit firmness, color and bricks, and the bricks will be a big area of our focus, my focus today, and nutrient availability, specific nutrients. So our focus is, is twofold. We talk about the principles of, the, of increasing bricks or soluble solids in, in crops, specifically in the citrus, and nutrient availability. And uh, we're going to we're going to focus primarily on the role of potassium in facilitating this this whole process. So let's uh, let's dive into uh, potassium discussion and. This, this discussion, while, while we're focusing on citrus, is applicable to, to all crops. A quick review of the role of potassium. It is responsible for water and nutrient movement within the plant. Um, the plant is essentially a pump that uh, pulls moisture out of the soil along with that nutrients. And this is regulated through the, uh, the stomata and the leaves. Potassium also is, uh, re regulates a number of different enzy enzymatic reactions, protein regulation. And the only mention really I'm going to make to nitrogen metabolism specifically is great potassium nutrition is very, very important for nitrogen to metabolize. And if nitrogen is not metabolized properly, uh, there's going to be a lot of challenges in crops, like getting uh, color, uh, solids, bricks, and so on. So I mentioned that um, that potassium regulates the uh, stomata, and they're highly concentrated in in the in all parts of the plants, but primarily in the leaves. And these essentially are the, the, the stoma regulate or are a pump that help pull the water and nutrients into the soil, help regulate that plant. And so what happens is if, uh, if potassium is in short supply to that plant, 
the plant's capability for, for water and nutrient utility is greatly reduced. So let's, a uh, little background on potassium. Let's, let's review um, the nature of potassium in the soil. Where there are three essential uh, states of, of availability of potassium in the soil. Potassium is, is, um, make, make, is abundant in the earth's crust. And the 99% of that potassium is in the form of what we call fixed. And this fixed is potassium is there, but it's it's really a component of the the the, the mineral in that soil, the mica, uh, the feldspar. And what you need to be aware of is this this ninety nine percent of that potassium when you do a soil analysis is not going to appear. Uh, the chemical extraction methods simply are not going to pull that out. The next stage of potassium is what we call exchangeable. And potassium with uh, a, a positive charge, a monovalent positive charge, uh, attaches to negative, negatively charged soil colloids. And that's what we refer to as exchangeable. And this, uh, this actually does show up when you have a soil analysis, a chemical soil analysis. Then the third stage, which represents a very small fraction of the potassium in the soil is what we call a solution potassium. This is of extensive interest to us because the only way to get potassium into the plant is when it's in solution. And what we mean by solution is when you have the chemical annotation K with plus by itself, it's not attached to any other, any other elements. It is um, in its ionic form, gonna pass through the root membrane and get into the plant. To be able to visualize this a little better, I, we have this additional graphic. And you can see here, we have the three stages uh, of potassium in the soil, starting with the, the fixed, that's very, very tightly held. And uh, with, uh, with time, with weathering, with moisture and air, the, this fixed potassium, can uh, become exchangeable potassium, can be there in the soil attached to the soil colloids. And then this exchangeable potassium has the opportunity to become a uh, solution or ionic potassium. So that process is, is, a, is a slow, continual process. But one of the interesting things about the nature of potassium, the dy dynamics of potassium in the soil, is the potassium will release slowly with time and weathering, but it will also go the opposite direction. You can actually uh, alter the equilibrium of solution potassium in the soil, and it'll adhere to the soil colloids. And then the high exchangeable capacity and imbalance can actually go to fix. So, so it is a dynamic process wherein is, as we fertilize, if, if the capabilities of that, that soil equilibrium are, are uh, in imbalance, we can actually cause a lot of our potassium that's applied to fix um, tightly into that soil colloid, okay? So this process, again, goes both ways. Well, what, is this, what does this mean? Well, on, on this, uh, this is an ex uh, a portion of a soil analysis where two methods of analyzing potassium content in the soil are, are being utilized. On the left-hand portion of the screen, this represents a, this is the so same soil, a chemical extraction. Okay, and uh, one of the measures is you look at, well, not only parts per million, but you look at the percent base saturation. In this case, it's 1.39%, and most would regard that as, as very low. On the right-hand portion of the screen, we have a different method, which is called the solution paste extract, wherein uh, water is 
is it added to the soil, it's put under vacuum, it's a specified process. And no surprise, the optimum versus the actual amount of potassium is very low. What, however, what, what often occurs is, is we look at a different soil with vast, um, immensely higher levels of potassium. And you can see the actual versus the average on the left-hand chemical extraction is quite high. It's, a, it's an abundant amount of potassium in that soil. However, that same soil on the right hand with a solution paste extract is showing that we're simply not releasing enough potassium or adequately. And this is, of course, when we have an opportunity to um, incorporate agronomic practices that facilitate that release as well as strategically apply potassium to the benefit of our crop. An interesting uh, article, um, a research uh, report, it was a compilation of research done at the University of Illinois. It's called the Potassium Paradox. And I'd like to cite this because it, it helps us understand this, this dynamic of soil relationships, you know, fix, fixation, timing, so on and so forth. The essence, the essence of this uh, test was to look at yield response on off-season off potassium applications and the relative impact on yield on corn. And they actually tested 2,100 different sites. And their findings were interesting, is that, that the uh, off-season potassium applications statistically did not increase yield. And so their conclusions were the following. If you add a large amount of potassium to the soil, you throw that soil into an, an imbalance of equilibrium, and that, that potassium, soluble uh, potassium is quickly going to go to exchangeable and fixed. And so the, and the, and what they cited was the greater the equilibrium, the faster the rate of change towards equilibrium. So in essence, what you find is you apply a bunch of potassium off season, but by the time that crop really needs that potassium, the, the soils kind of got back to where it started from. And so their point is, what's the purpose of potassium? It's to provide soluble or ionic potassium to that, to that soil or to the plant, to deliver to the plant. And so their, their conclusion is don't make the soil a competitor. So don't, don't throw the potassium out when the plant is not capable of utilizing it because a large percentage of that potassium uh, may not be available when the crop requires it. So potassium is taken up in the plant of the, of the three different uh, mechanisms absorption, diffusion, and mass flow. Uh, diffusion where, is where you have a gradient of con a low concentration, high concentration, and mass flow is, of course, the, the movement of those nutrients into the plant. And so, so some of the strategies we'll talk about uh, as far as potassium and assuring that you can get the maximum benefit for the budget dollar is, is important to, re to recognize how potassium is released and how it moves into the plant. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to summarize some key strategies. And these can, these can apply to, to any cropping system. But uh, of course, we're talking about citrus here specifically. Well, no, no surprise, I'm going to mention timing. Um, Timing, why? Well, when you need the potassium, when the crop requires the potassium, is going to be the most appropriate time to apply potassium so that we don't have loss uh, of the potassium availability. But another important aspect of timing and potassium is that for all, all the benefits it provides to crops, an application of potassium at the wrong time can actually have a very negative impact on the crop. 
On the right hand side of this graphic, we list uh, four of the five major cations or positively charged elements that are found in the soil. Uh, you have potassium at the top, calcium, sodium, magnesium, and then hydrogen if your soil is, is acidic. Well, what happens is these cations, these positively charged elements, if one is delivered to the crop uh, in, in, in excess at any particular time, you can actually inhibit the uptake of other, of other of these cations. And the one that is of most concern to us is calcium uptake. Well, calcium uh, uptake is going to be critical during key stages of growth, but when we're talking about fruit production, during bloom, post-bloom, during cell development, calcium nutrition is very, very important. The message we're going to, I'm, I'm going to get across here is that if you do a luxury application of potassium, in other words, you give it a nice shot of potassium, right during that bloom or post-bloom period during that cell development, you can very quickly off overwhelm the calcium uptake and the plant, the, the fruit will actually get a high level of potassium instead of calcium. What tends to happen is that problem doesn't manifest itself until we get closer to harvest. And that fruit is going to have some cell wall strength uh, uh, challenges and it's it's not going to ship process or or store very well and so we want to be very cautious about being aggressive with potassium when calcium is required okay the other the next point is going to be frequency um, there are there are situations on cropping systems where you simply do not have the option of of applying it during the season you perhaps you don't have a, a delivery method you don't have a fertigation system or you can't apply it so you you are obligated to apply that uh, pre-season or perhaps only once or twice well that is cer certainly a limiting factor however when it comes to potassium by far the best utilization, no matter what our input selection of that budget dollar, is going to come from timing those applications when it's most important and applying as frequently as is practical. So timing, the, the, a, a rule of thumb is the greater the water requirements of that plant, that is when your potassium uh, requirements will be the greatest. So as, as you visualize that as, as that plant is pulling more water, that is when potassium is going to be uh, most important. So from a frequency standpoint, the more the better, lighter, lighter applications more frequently. You just have to balance that with practicality. The third key strategy, and this applies to, um, to again, to all crops where you have moisture, soil moisture management challenges is always going to be where potassium nutrition is the most challenging. In other words, where you have poor water penetration, where you have soil that uh, it does not drain well, we have poor air water relationships, that impede, those conditions impede that, that natural weathering or release of potassium in the soil. And even, even when you're able to apply potassium uh, frequently and to, when you have poor penetration, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a challenge. So it's one of the agronomic principles is you know, get, get your irrigation management, whatever you need to do to get those ideal air water relationships in that root zone. Those are gonna be conditions where you'll have better potassium nutrition. The next concept is, is input selection. Um, and we're going to talk a little more in detail about that in a moment. This is essential to identify how, where are we going to allocate our dollars on potassium to get the best uh, response. 
And one of the one of the first keys to that is you need to look at solubility. How readily does the fertilizer release that potassium in the ionic or basic form? Okay. Next, you want to assess well that positively charged potassium is going to be attached to something with a negative charge. Is that anion going to impede progress of my crop or is it going to help me? The next, we want to look at cost, but we also want to look at cost per application because in many cases, a very expensive material per ton or per pound can often give us our best crop response cost per acre. Next, we want to be aware of bioavailability, how, how well is it absorbed into the plant and, and moved within the plant. And last but not least, what is the net effect from a plant metabolism standpoint? Because some potassium materials have additional benefits that are very, very positive. Okay. So with that, those potassium strategies, I'm just throwing up a graphic here where we've, we've used some of the major potassium materials uh, and then added a, a couple of our own, where you can look at the relative solubility, hey, what's the effect of that anion, what's the cost per unit, cost per application, bioavailability, and so on. And as you can see there, there tend to be pros and cons of, of every uh, element, okay? For example, it's potassium chloride has good solubility. Uh, however, you have uh, the chloride, which can be, um, in many cropping systems, a, uh, a, a poor uh, cofactor when we, when we talk about potassium. So it's a, and it's, it's a cheap material uh, relative to other inputs, but the cost per application, um, the bioavailability tends to be poor. So we tend to use lots of material uh, to trying to get that potassium response. So depending on the cropping system, we want to we want to consider that. Uh, then on the opposite end of the scale, you look at dicap, which has a very good solubility. The phosphorus in it is a very good metabolic companion. Very high cost per unit, but cost per application is only moderate because the crop response is very good with, with low use rates, okay? Um, so let's just talk about uh, three uh, products from Redox related to DICAP that have, have shown to have a very distinct benefit on improving bricks and solids and, uh, and as well as size in the crops because I want, I want to point out that potassium not only helps the accumulation of, of the solids typically later in the season prior to harvest, but helps expand those cells so you get bigger, bigger fruit size. So DICAP is a, a potassium phosphorus material that is unique and it, it really promotes plant respiration and increases antioxidant production, speaking of these metabolic benefits. Uh, increases stomatal conductors, uh, conductance and is a, a very, a very good um, uh, potassium and phosphorus response product. It could be applied either through a fertigation system or it can be applied via foliar application. It does not seem to make a difference on either way, and the use rates are extremely low. And this product on, on citrus, we're typically applying one or two pounds per acre. And the, the, the uh, frequency of that application is largely gonna be driven by the specifics of that crop. But in, in general, every two to four weeks, as later in the season as that water uh, consumption increases, we see very good reduction in heat stress, better potassium levels, which greatly enhance the, the accumulation of those soluble solids in the crop and the size of the fruit as well, okay? So this, is the, this would be the, the primary tool from Redox to enhance uh, bricks and solids and, and size. 
Another variation of that of die cap is banks where it also has zinc and boron. So in cropping systems where you need the zinc and boron as well, uh, you have the, the banks is a, is a terrific uh, product. A lot of banks is utilized uh, post-harvest for carbohydrate storage. And so that's a very good fit for this, applying this with an ammoniacal nitrogen via a, a foliar spray is a very, very good program. The third pro product is called Platinum. And this is a, a product that is, is um, a liquid material with uh, well, half the content of platinum is dicap. And then we have uh, a very uh, unique phosphorus compound in this product designed for root, uh, lateral root growth stimulation. And then a key component of this product for uh, improving soil microbial activity. So if you're looking for multiple benefits with one application, that's where we'd use platinum. Um, I will, because my, my time is up, I would just like to very quickly discuss a, um, a, a trial that was done in strawberries, but strawberries are a very good crop to analyze because of the, the uh, high potassium requirements. So in this case, this was done uh, not too far from where, where Danny lives in Ventura County. And we are comparing a conventional uh, potassium program to redox. And I'll mention that the potassium inputs met all the criteria for solubility, as well as the timing was exactly the same. So solubility and timing were not an issue and you can see in the redox program significantly less potassium was utilized 86 percent less however when we looked at uh, the yield as well as the fruit size uh, the the redox potassium products performed uh, very well okay all right that is all i all i have and uh, with that i will turn the time back over to you danny Thanks, John. Let's see, let me get my screen share. Oh, wrong button. Let's get my screen share up here. And we'll hop into the next. <clears throat> Did anybody have any questions they wanted to ask John? Um, we can take a brief pause here if you had a potassium specific question you wanted to uh, throw out there before I hop in here on micronutrients. Got one here from Mitch. What do you do when you have several different stages of fruit, including bloom on one plant to time potassium and not antagonize calcium uptake? Oh, excellent question. And that's uh, your, the lemon example as well. Strawberries is a perfect example because you have literally bloom, cell development, cell enlargement, ripening, color, solids, everything's all happening at once. And they, the answer actually is quite simple. You, you need to have a very strong and robust calcium program. So if you're gonna address potassium, you address calcium at the same time. You never leave one or the other behind. And that, that has worked well. Great, thanks Mitch. All right, um, I'm gonna get going here on micronutrients and maybe, let's see here. Okay, so micronutrients. Now everybody's uh, fairly familiar with macronutrients and micronutrients. So macronutrients, we've got our N, P, and K, and then more recently they've, um, you know, in the past two or three decades, they've, they've stuck calcium and magnesium and sulfur into that macronutrient category as well um, because there is a decent amount of them used in the plant. Now there's also micronutrients, and we're gonna concentrate on a couple of these today in our discussion that are very relevant in citrus production. Um, zinc, manganese, iron, boron, copper, molybdenum are the major micronutrients. Chlorine and um, sodium also show up there. Um, luckily, we generally have plenty of that around. You need a very special laboratory to show that those are required. And then other nutrients that can show up in some plants, we have cobalt, nickel, and silicon are also of utility. Um, we'll talk more about silicon maybe um, in our next session, 
of the Citrus webinar where we're going to talk more about bloom time applications and calcium programs. So, um, so let's hop in here into the micronutrients. Um, if you're looking to do a deep dive into micronutrients, I can't recommend this book high enough. Um, Marshner's Mineral Nutrition of Higher Plants. It really is the end all be all of plant nutrition texts. And um, if you want to uh, really read eight, nine pages on what zinc does uh, in very tiny font in a plant in a nice summarized way, there's your source. So um, that's where a lot of this information is pulled out of today. So like I said, let's hop in here about these five uh, micronutrients in size, solid, and bricks as our challenge here. Now, magnesium um, falls in that macronutrient category, but a lot of people still throw it into the micronutrients um, because it's generally applied like a micronutrient. So it's the central ion of chlorophyll. You can see there's some, some uh, mixed deficiency there, but notably magnesium with the yellowing tips um, from the margins. And um, it's important also in phosphorylation. Uh, a lot of these micronutrients are, are essential in protein synthesis and enzyme activity. So you'll see that on most of these micros that that's where they show up. Um, and what that means is they're being used within the cell machinery to produce sugars and carbohydrates and things like that, that we need to fill those fruits. So when we have a deficiency in a micronutrient, we are losing yield potential. I like to think of leaves as little solar panels and um, the green parts are what's actually making energy and the yellow parts are the broken parts. Um, and that's showing that we have a micronutrient deficiency depending on that pattern and that we need to address that. So we make sure we have all of our little leaves, our little solar panels functioning at tip top capacity to pump out as much fruit as we can financially feasibly produce. So, um, so magnesium really important in tree energy and fruit production. Next, let's go to zinc. So, Zinc is important in ribosomal structures, oxygen synthesis, cell membrane integrity. That's why when we have a zinc deficiency, we see short internode lengths and also small leaves. That's what that oxygen synthesis. It's also important in enzymes, structural components, protein synthesis, carbohydrate metabolism, so on and so forth. And really when we have a zinc deficiency, fruit size is what really hits us in our pocketbook, is what we see at the end of the season, small fruit. Uh, iron, we see this a lot in lemons. Uh, structural, it's structural and chloroplast. You get this, um, you know, this uh, intervenal chlorosis where the veins or all the veins stay deep green, but the intervenal space turns yellow. Um, it's important root elongation. Uh, when we have uh, oversaturated soils, iron deficiencies show up pretty quickly, and also root stress, iron deficiencies show up very quickly. Um, it's important in all of the other factors as well. So we really think crop vigor and roots. So that's something that we uh, uh, that are important. Um, manganese is kind of the last of these uh, functional micro, micronutrients that fit into this pro protein synthesis, carbohydrate and lipid synthesis um, categories. Also important enzymatic catalysts, photosynthesis, photosystems, and then cell division elongation. Also a very, very important one in most fruiting plants, especially citrus. So crop vigor for manganese and its ability to deal with stress. And then lastly, we have boron, and we'll talk more about boron in depth during our next talk around pollination and how to make sure that we, uh, we set the crop that we need for the following year. But um, boron plays a big role in calcium transport for early fruit development, as well as reproductive tissue development, pollination, root elongation. Um, and it, it can be a challenge, especially in highly leached soils, um, to maintain boron availability. So um, all of these things, push into size solids and bricks because that is the final the final use of all that energy that we're trying to produce. So what are the challenges with getting micronutrients into the plant? So micronutrients, just like many other, uh, most other nutrients, um, the root is out there trying to get micronutrients out of the soil. So we need to have a healthy root system, a strong root system. And we talked at length about that in our last webinar. Um, but that is a, a key component. One of the big challenges, however, that the root has is that a lot of micronutrients will tie up in the soil, so or in the in the soil solution. So we have here in this example, we have zinc, and you can see an iron. We're making iron sulfate and iron phosphate and things like that in the soil. So we have which are not readily available for that plant. That plant's going to have to somehow mine that um, compound out so it can pull in that ionic zinc or that ionic iron and use it for its metabolic processes. So what do we do to overcome that as a farmer? We use chelation technology, right? Chelation technology has been um, on the market for decades. Um, we react a divalent cation for the purpose of preventing undesirable chemical reactions. So we take a zinc ion and then we combine it with EDTA or amino acids or some other chelating agent 
and that stabilizes that charge that prevents that zinc from turning back into zinc sulfate in the soil and allows it to remain available and the plant's able to recognize it and take it up. So um, I mentioned EDTA chelates. So EDTA chelation, once again, a basic uh, classic technology that's been on the market, very effective for chelating metal ions. Um, however, one of the challenges with EDTA chelation is that the EDTA molecule itself is not very useful within the plant and has to be um, kicked out of, the, out of the plant, otherwise it can actually build up at toxic levels within the plant. So the plant has the mechanism to kick that back out of the root. However, um, that takes energy and we're in the market of making sure our plants use the majority of their energy for making uh, fruit that we can make money off of. So we're not a big fan of that here. Um, we at Redox have developed products that are based more so on amino acid and other carbons that are highly, highly utilized by the plant in their cellular machinery. So we rely here on amino acid chelation in this example. And the amino acids that are used are, are also used by the plant to produce energy and um, build crop tissue, and especially in pushing bricks and um, pound solids and things like that and finishing fruit because that amino acid is immediately available to produce tissue. So um, we've developed this line of micronutrients, we call them the triplex line, and that technology is used in all of our products that contain micronutrients. It's uh, triplex because we use amino acids, fulvic and humic acids to um, complex or chelate all of the nutrients that are in there and keep them available for the plant to take up. So we've overcome this issue of compounds being formed with the metal ions and making them not available in the soil by um, reacting them with, uh, with soluble carbon such as amino acids to make sure that they remain available in soil solution or in, or in a spray tank or on the full or on the foliage or on the leaf surface so that we end up with um, available nutrition. So all of that's important. I just want to throw this back up there to say we need to have roots down there to pull up that nutrition and um, and maintain and maintain crop vigor and make sure that the cellular machinery continues to function and produce us fruit that we can take to market. Um, so it's common, however, to see when we have um, root stress or some other type of stress on the plant, we'll see these general micronutrient deficiencies. If you stare long enough at that picture, I think you can find most of the micronutrient deficiencies we just talked about um, in terms of leaf phenology, um, or so that uh, representing the different micronutrient deficiencies. So this is a general micronutrient deficiency issue, which is probably more so related to a root stress situation. So we need to address the causal agent of this, which is probably a watering issue in this particular block when we took this picture, but we also need to treat the symptoms, right? So the symptoms are we have micronutrient deficiencies, which is our immediate limiting factor, but we also need to make sure we solve the problem because a healthy root system should be pulling up micronutrients and, um, and we should only have to supplement where in this case, this is, um, we're gonna need to provide the majority. So um, Redox, we've developed a, a fairly comprehensive micronutrient portfolio to help support the needs of the grower and the tree. Uh, we're gonna not focus on all these today, but I wanted to drill in on, on maybe some that are relevant immediately within the, within the crop cycle where we're at today. And so we have Triplex Microflowable. It was really built around fruiting plants and it's a, a, a nice package for citrus uh, with, uh, you can see they're born in copper at 0.66%, uh, iron 2.1, manganese and zinc at the same level and then a hint of molybdenum thrown in there. It's a liquid formulation, which makes it very convenient. Um, and have utilizes our, amino, our L amino acid chelation technology, improves nitrogen metabolism, contains soluble carbon. So, and it's as an added benefit, it works great as a foliar. It also works great in soil. So, um, furthermore, we've got a uh, an organic version of the same product. This one's the organic version is a microcrystal, uh, highly soluble, 2% boron, 2% copper, 6% iron, manganese, and zinc with, once again, that touch of molybdenum. So um, it can be a very powerful tool to help push that micronutrient availability uh, within your plant and make sure that we don't have those limiting factors, right? Because when we start having yellow leaves, that means we are losing yield and losing our tree's potential to, um, to build fruit for us. So um, that's about what I wanted to add in here about micronutrients. The uh, next couple minutes I wanted to hand over to some of our field agronomists that have a lot of experience in citrus and talk about some in-field solutions. 
So um, I want to in introduce both of them first, and then we'll hop into their. Uh, well, well, we'll start with Jared, then we'll come back and introduce Chris. So Jared is our uh, is a Redux agronomist here in California. He works in the Central Valley of California. He's worked with Redux Bionutrients for ten years, providing experience and solutions for a variety of crops across California. So I will scoot over here to California Naval Program and hand it over to Jared. Thank you, Danny. And yeah, so I'll just take a couple minutes. I can't control that, Danny, so you'll have to slide it up for me. Um, just to look at a couple things. We this, this fertility, I think you've emailed this out to everybody that is participating today. So this gives you a sense of some common things that are done here in California. This is Naval Program. Uh, you can slide down to, yeah, that May, June, July period. So looking at these products and what, what John talked about and Danny, I think just giving an idea of what, what happens, what are rates and recommendations that go out, really in that May, June, July timeframe, um, we're obviously just past that, but where DICAP, uh, H85, Mainstay Calcium are used. But that August, September, where we find ourselves today, we really like to focus on our soil applications where we're, we're focusing on getting our uh, our size, our bulking. We've got a lot of small, mid, mid-sized fruit um, that's sizing rapidly. We've got a lot of heat happening right now, so we are regularly applying DICAP H85. We'd like to get at least a couple applications on this time period, maybe three, uh, depending on your crop load, the, the, the yield goals that the grower has. H85 is a nice complement to that DICAP uh, just to help with uh, micronutrient availability and improve soil health conditions uh, at those time frame and that as Danny just went over that can play uh, it can be nice this time frame uh, in, when the summer heat is on us and we need those micronutrients so scroll up to the uh, the fuller nutrition same time frame go a little further up right about there we'll go June July and November so on a foliar sense, there's still a couple of sprays those uh, June and July uh, I've got some foliar uh, applications that are being made um, that you've got flush happening and uh, you've got uh, a few trips through the orchard here. Crystal rate that Danny talked about, that's one pound. That's a pretty sufficient rate there. I, I wouldn't see a need to go above that or two pounds here in California. We get nice response out of the one pound. Now, if you're going to use the flowable, triplex micro flowable, you'd probably be around that court. Uh, maybe a touch under uh, would be a, a nice rate on your flowable there. And then it, here in the distance here is, is your, that last spray. Typically, we'll get on another spray in November before harvest. Um, that you know, harvest time frame, depending on the market and how your fruit looks. You want to get on the early side if you can, if you're working with your packer and he'll take your fruit. But we like to finish it as a foliar of die cap at a pound, triplex micro, and then mainstay SI, which is our calcium silicon product. And that typically finishes off our year well and we're we're trying to improve the 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 sugar with one of sugars or the bricks but really to help support that bulking or size um, we want to get more on the, the heavier size uh, profile if we can and the combination between the soil and this foliar approach um, these citrus they're, they're hogs you know you got to feed them because uh, you've got so much going on like you're talking about danny with so many different stages of fruit and so we want to feed them both ways and that's that's what we do here those are our typical rates and uh, general recommendations on soil and foliar thanks jared um so next we're going to switch over here to chris so chris is our uh as our southeast regional manager for redox with extensive experience in citrus turf and pecans and um he worked with he's worked with Redox for over eleven years now, providing expertise and solutions in a variety of crops across the southeast. So let's see here. So here's Chris's Florida program. Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. All right. So if, just kind of wanted to touch on the the die cap product mainly. Um, you know my my over a decade of experience in, in various crops, uh, specifically fruiting uh, and and nut crops. Uh, die cap has become a product that you can't really use too much of it. It is a timing product, uh, but as as I see it, rejuvenation during stress events is is the the key point that die cap 
provides that rejuvenation. Um, so as citrus in South Florida, uh, the temperature, humidity, uh, growing in sand, uh, water is always an issue. Uh, DICAP just offers that rejuvenation ability of the plant to start the process back up after after heating uh, or, or drought events. I know that we've we've done die cap in several different situations uh, over the last you know, seven or eight years uh, from Georgia to, to Florida uh, and it's always provided a return on investment. Um, you know the timing hasn't been specific uh, and no one one application has been the same. Um, so we look at you know the fruit load. We look at what we're trying to accomplish as far as goals, whether it's you know size bricks, uh, heat stress, and the things that are caused by heat stress like fruit drop. Um, also, you know sizing is always an issue during the heat. So so its ability to to do these things as far as nitrogen metabolism. Uh, stimulate some antioxidant production, provide that phosphorus and potassium. Uh, DICAP along with the, the micronutrients has, has always been a great return on investment. Um, you know, as, as, as we've been down, like I say, in Florida for you know, seven or eight years now, um, several of our, our, our growers down there that we've been working with have seen some benefits and we're still learning a lot about what DICAP is doing inside of the plant uh, for uh, the, the secondary metabolites and, and processes that the plant is being stimulated to accomplish with the use of DICAP. So, uh, so as you can see, you know, our, our, that two pound rate, um, I'd love to say four pounds, but two pounds does just as good as four pounds and sometimes one pound does very well. So. So as far as rates um, and, and, and timing application for bricks and, and sizing would, in Florida would be, you know, for, from now until, you know, two to three weeks before harvest, uh, you would get definitely a return on investment with those applications. So uh, that's my input. Thank you. Right. Appreciate <laughs> it, Chris. And Chris and Jared will be here. Um, for the end for questions. So if you got some specific questions, they'll be here. So, um, so just to sum it up, Redox is a bionutrient company that focuses on sustainable plant nutrition. I hope we've communicated that to you guys today and, uh, and also some of our excitement and passion about growing plants. Um, the, we have another session here of our Citrus uh, Solutions webinar series. Our next one will be in November. So we're going to take a little break here until the next key timing uh, we'll be uh, talking about bloom set and drop prevention. So uh, we've got some great university trials we want to share with you and um, have some uh, great tools to help with that timing. Well, I'll get the website updated here soon. Uh, so you'll be able to register for that webinar then. And of course, we'll notify you um, when, it, when it's available. So um, with that, thank you so much for um, tuning in. Uh, and you, our contact information is there. We're happy to hook you up as well. I should have put Jared's and, uh, and Chris's on here as well, but I'm um, happy to connect you guys with, with them if you'd like. Um, you can also find their contact information on our website.